Hey there. I hope you've been having a really brave week. Believing brave. Believing God who is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he's going to do. I pray that um, you've been praying brave and believing brave. And now we're going to talk about forgiving brave. <laughs> I feel pretty brave just having this conversation with you because forgiveness feels like this gigantic subject and I'm just like what what would I what would I have to say that hasn't been said God what what could you say through me that's new about forgiveness and I just felt him nudge me that um he likes to echo himself that it doesn't have to be new it could be just a reminder of what we've already learned because we need a reminder constantly about all sorts of things and forgiveness is a big thing it's a big deal to God and to us for our own freedom. And so I would just like to encourage you to consider this and everything I ever share as just the beginning of a conversation that you could be having with the Lord. Let it just spark a new idea or maybe bring to remembrance an old idea, something that you've known before that um, maybe just needs some dusting off and picking back up and being reintegrated into your daily living. So I wanted to look up the definition for forgiveness. And so I found two, one on Wikipedia and one from a Greek lexicon from the word of God. So the one from the Greek, it comes from the Hebrew or the Greek word, um, C863, if you're interested. I find, I, I love this website called blueletterbible.org. You can find all the original Greek and Hebrew meanings of the words that are in the scripture. And I just love to study God's word that way. Um, so anyways, some of the definitions for this um, word forgiveness. How often do I forgive my brother? The word forgive meant to let go, to set free, and to keep no longer. And I just loved considering forgiveness and what it how it relates to letting go and to being set free and to no longer keeping like bitterness and anger and resentment and frustration or, and then off of Wikipedia, I loved this definition too. It said, um, forgiveness is intentional and voluntary process by which the one who feels victimized undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding a given offense and overcomes negative emotions such as resentment and vengeance. And so what I hear from that is that forgiveness is a process of overcoming. And isn't that like the Christian life? It's a process of overcoming. So we know how to do that. We know how to be in the process. So I was kind of trying to say, like, what does forgiveness say? And this is what I came up with. Forgiveness says, I'm choosing to release my grip from all the pain that's been caused to me by whomever. And I'm going to turn all those people back over fully to God. I'm releasing my grip on the pain and on the people and turning it all back over to God, because I'm not going to allow myself to stay stuck as a victim any longer. What happened was, and you could, you could fill that in. It was bad. It was traumatizing. It was horrible. It was incomprehensible. You can fill that blank in with whatever. What happened was this, this really happened. What happened was awful, but it's not happening anymore. But you know what is happening? Me. I am happening and as I release you, I'm set free to become even more me. And I'm worth it. I'm worth becoming. I'm worth letting you go so that I can become. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would deal with them as you dealt with me with mercy and justice. That's what forgiveness says. And my takeaways from that were maybe I have been a victim. Like maybe that's real, but that's not what defines me. And that I'm worth letting go of past pain to continue growing. You are worth letting go of past pain to continue growing. So some 
keys for forgiving brave are to remember how God has forgiven you. Psalm 140, 143 verse 4. It's like, remember what God has done. When you need encouragement to forgive someone else, remember how God has forgiven you. Another key is to remember how other people have forgiven you. You know, maybe you really did hurt somebody's heart or hurt them in their life. And they said, you know what? I forgive you. And let that spur you on to be the kind of person that extends forgiveness. And then Matthew 6, 14 and Mark 11, 25 says that if we forgive others, the Father can forgive us. And so another key to forgiving brave is to see that no one is important enough to deserve keeping you from God's forgiveness. So if we look back at our Wikipedia definition, it says that forgiveness is a process and we, um, we want to consider this. Have you ever said, oh, I forgive you and you meant it in your heart and then something reminded you of the situation. You get all stirred up again and all angry and, and wrought up and sad again. And you're like, oh, I thought I forgave them. I guess I didn't. Maybe I don't even know how to forgive. You know, we can kind of get all messed up. But I want to tell you, that doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. It means that you've maybe only begun the process. But beginning the process of forgiving is brave. And I celebrate your bravery in saying, I want to forgive and I'm going to start forgiving, but I'm going to recognize it's not one and done that every time I'm triggered in a memory of this thing happening, if, if I, I get all stirred up again, I'm going to forgive again. And I believe this is kind of what Jesus was talking to us about. And Matthew 18, 21 and 22, Peter said, so you know, when my brother sins against me, how often, like up to how many times should I forgive him? Maybe like up to seven. Does that sound good? And Jesus looks at him and says, I'm going to, I'm not telling you up to seven. I'm going to tell you seven times 70. And in other words, I believe that Jesus was saying, it's a process. You're going to have to keep forgiving people, even if they don't necessarily keep offending you. It could be a long ago thing. And as it comes up, you're going to have to choose forgiveness, choose forgiveness. Choose forgiveness. And Jesus modeled that for us, right? He chose forgiveness. He gave us forgiveness for our sin and, and constantly he's forgiving us when we come to him and we repent and we say, Father, forgive me. He says, oh, you're forgiven. And so if we're receiving that grace, we want to extend that grace. But here's how it can be misunderstood. Jesus did not say, Remain in a deep, connected, toxic relationship with someone unwilling to be transformed by the renewing of their mind, Romans 12, 2. He did not say, keep forgiving and just be a doormat. No. In fact, earlier, even in that same chapter in the Bible, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, it says, if your brother sins against you, the first thing you do is you go to that person and him alone and say, whoa, this is not Okay. I don't feel loved. I don't feel seen. I don't feel heard. This isn't good for you. This isn't good for me. And if they don't care, or they're unwilling to meet you there and pursue reconciliation, then it says the second thing we do is we go find two more people who love both of you. And you say, Hey, I love you. Like, what is going on? This isn't going to bring us closer. This isn't going to bring us closer to each other, bring us closer to God. This isn't what I want for our relationship. It's not safe. I don't feel safe. I don't feel protected, loved, covered, cherished, you know, whatever. And if they're still unwilling to be um, about reconciliation, about humbling their heart and you humbling your heart and coming back together, it says then you go to the congregation. You get some godly counsel and you bring that into the mix. And if they're still unwilling to be changed, that you create distance between your heart and theirs because it's not okay and it's not safe. So clearly we can see just within one chapter of the Bible that toxic relationships are not equal to forgiveness. You can actually forgive someone without telling them about it. 
maybe they're, you've already recognized they're not safe, but you separated without forgiving them. You can just, within your own heart, tell the Lord, I'm choosing to let go of these chains that are binding me to this person. I'm letting go so that I can be free. I forgive them and I release them back fully to you. I lay them down. But here's something so interesting. So I felt like the Lord was saying it's so, so, so important to forgive others. But it has to start with learning how to forgive yourself. And he was showing me um, Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But then Mark 12, 31 says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you are not being kind and forgiving to yourself, you're not going to have kindness and forgiveness to give away. And so it's like he showed me how important it is that we change the tape of our self-talk. And I heard these words like, I'm so stupid. I should have known better. Why do I always screw up? I'm failing at literally everything. I hate being me. I heard that. And what I saw was I saw like a cassette, an old cassette player. And I saw like God hit the eject button and pull the tape out and like pull the, all the tape that's inside of the cassette tape out. So it could never be played again, totally destroyed. And then there was a new tape that got in, um, put in and then pressed play and the volume was turned really loud. And it said these things. It said, oh, I didn't know that yet, but now I do. So next time this is going to go a little better. <sighs> Just because I didn't get it right doesn't mean I'm stupid. It means I'm learning and growing. And he showed me Psalm 86, um, 15 through 16, that God is slow to get angry, but he's full of compassion. So being his reflection, he wants us to be full of compassion, not just for others, but also for ourselves. Another thing I heard on that new tape said, I do not have anyone expecting me to perform perfectly. I am safe to make a mistake and to learn. I just love that. And he showed me 1 Peter 5, 6 or 7, humble yourselves before God, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. Another thing I heard was, it is a gift to be alive, to be a unique expression of Jesus and allow him to be made strong in my weaknesses. And so that comes from 2 Corinthians uh, twelve ten. And then the other thing I heard was, his grace is enough for me. 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 And that's from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And one way I was taught to start practicing exchanging the self-hatred tape to the self-compassion tape was when I make a mistake to think, how would I say, what would I say to a friend who just made the same mistake? Would I say to her, gosh, you're terrible. I can't believe you did that. You're so stupid. Nobody even thinks that being around you is awesome because you always mess everything up. Like, would I say that? I would never say that. I would say something like, we all make mistakes. You're not alone in that. And sometimes our mistakes are big and sometimes our mistakes are small, but we don't stop at the mistake. We learn, we grow, we become, we apologize, we move forward. You don't have to let this define you. You can find your way through it and I know you're going to come out stronger. That's what I would say to anyone else in the world. So why am I saying mean, awful things to me? The Lord was showing me this truth bomb that we have an enemy who hates us and who will consistently be unkind in every possible way to us and that we don't need to help him. We don't need to agree with him. We get to choose to agree with the narrative that God has about us. And so how do we do that? This is what he showed me. You make a mistake, and instead of going, I'm so terrible, I'm so awful, I'm so stupid, I'm so dumb, I'm failing, I'm screwing it all up, it's not even worth it to try because I just always make the same mistakes. Instead of saying all those things to myself, I can instead quickly run to Jesus and say, you know what, 
God, I got it wrong. Would you please forgive me for this and help me to forgive myself? And what is it I could learn right now, Lord? What do you want me to know? See the big, massive difference? Proverbs 28, 13 through 14 and 1 John 1, 9 and through 2, 1 talks about confessing our sins quickly. And we can just consider it that. Just forgive me, God. I didn't hit the mark this time. You knew that was going to happen or else you wouldn't have shed your blood for me. Help me to learn and grow and become more like you. Become more the person you had in mind when you created me. I need you. I can't do this apart from you. If we run to Jesus, we will quickly be set free and encouraged. This is very brave. Often when we're refusing to forgive ourselves, we enter into like isolation and just sit and steep in our shame. And it, it drains us. And we sit around and we think about ourselves all day long. And that's not going to do ourselves or the kingdom of God any good. So we're going to shift that. And we're going to choose the higher way because we're being brave now. And you are very, very brave. And you are very, very loved. And you're going to make these changes. And it seems small, but it's going to change everything. I can see it. But sometimes there's another type of forgiveness we have to practice. And that's when we have to forgive God. And this is a little uncomfortable to talk about because a lot of people don't like to admit being angry at God. But I mean, just consider it. Uh, the book of Job, like sometimes bad things happen, hard, painful things happen. And we're like, God, if you chose to, you could have intervened or you could have spared me from this heartbreak or this pain or this crisis in my life, but you chose not to. I don't get that. And I'm kind of mad because I thought we were like friends and you didn't show up. And my heart's broken and I feel betrayed and I feel abandoned. That's what we do. That's the brave thing to do is to run to him with that, to grieve and to feel and be mad and to not pretend and just start to say all the right things, you know, to make other people feel comfortable. No, be honest, be truthful, be genuinely where you're at. God can handle our hurt. Even if it's at him through confusion or crisis, he will never stop loving you. That's Psalm 136. And he will never leave you. It's Deuteronomy 31, 6. He will always love you. Psalm 89, 33. He will always protect you. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3. He will always comfort you. Isaiah 66, 13. And he will heal you. He will heal you. Exodus 15, 26. Even while your heart is still filled with hurt towards him. He can handle it. He can handle it. His love for you isn't and never has been contingent on your love for him. Remember Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He went all the way before we even thought about him. So the best thing you can do, the bravest thing you can do is come to him and say it all. You broke my heart. feels like you abandoned me. There's no way this could be good. What were you thinking? Where were you? Why didn't you show up? Why didn't you stop this? When you're in control and you're sovereign and you're all powerful, but you chose to allow this, I don't know how that could possibly be good come to him. That's the brave thing. The worst thing you could do is be mad at him and choose to run away from him and harden your heart towards him. And here's why. Because you're quickly going to grow weary from trying to carry a burden that is too heavy. You were not made to carry the burdens of this life. You were made to walk with him and let him do the heavy lifting. So even when you're really hurt, you're really confused, and you're really angry, come to him, run to him, and be real with him. Be mad, but come to him mad. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary 
and heavy, and I will give you rest. As you come to him, his presence will, over time, begin to dissipate your anger and take your fears and collect your tears, and he will replace them. And here's some promises about that. Psalm 30, 11 through 12. You've turned my mourning into dancing and taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Come to him in your mourning and watch what he can do with it. He can transform your mourning into dancing and he can take the heavy garment you're wearing and he can replace it with joy. Isaiah 61, three says, he bestows upon me a crown of beauty for my ashes, an oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So we've got to run to him when we have a spirit of despair, when we're grieving and mourning and we have nothing, it's all burnt up and it's nothing but ashes. We have nothing to offer. We still run to him and he takes it and he exchanges it for something beautiful. Run to him. Run to him. Even when it's him, you need to forgive. The only way to work through that is by running to him. It is brave to enter in and stay in the process of forgiveness that leads to overcoming. It is brave to forgive others. It's brave to forgive yourself and it's brave to forgive God. You do not have to forgive perfectly. You can just try. Just try. If it's a long ago thing that's like resulted in a root of bitterness and today's the day and you're like, you know what? I don't want to hold on to these chains anymore. I want to be free. Just try. Just try to say, I forgive this person. It doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be pretty. Just let it be real and let it be the beginning. Recognize it might be a long process, but you've got to start somewhere and now is the time. I used to have a message on my voicemail back when we called and left voicemails that said, um, Today is a great day to forgive. And I believe every day is the right day to start that forgiveness process. And you do not have to stay in relationship with somebody to forgive them. It's okay to let a person go physically and emotionally if they are toxic for you. God is not asking you to stay in toxic relationships. Forgiveness is for you and it sets you free. And because of John 8, 36, we know that he came to set us free indeed. Father, I just thank you so much for the gift of forgiveness that you lavish upon us, that we could drown in the ocean of your grace because it's so lavish and abundant and overwhelming. Thank you for the kind of forgiveness we have received because of your blood and because of your love and your sacrifice. Help us to remember the kind of grace you've extended to us and to be willing to echo that into the world and be bringers of lavish grace and forgiveness. And help us to never confuse giving lavish grace with being victims of toxic habitually toxic relationships. Help us to live by the Matthew 18, 15 through 17, to go to the person and to bring somebody with us and then to bring godly counsel and to recognize that there's a point where we have to let go of a person if they're unwilling to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Help us to not confuse unforgiveness with safety and distancing our hearts from people who can't honor who you've created us to be. Teach us this week, God, about any opportunity we have to forgive others, ourselves, or forgive you. Help us to be real and honest. Help us to be okay if it's just another layer of the process. Help us to stay in the process and to overcome. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing. But we're not apart from you. We're in you, and you're in us, and we're in the Father. And there's no lack in you. So help us 
to come from that place of abundance and to abundantly forgive and abundantly share grace and abundantly receive grace and abundantly be set free. We love you. We trust you. We want more of you. And it is by your blood and your spirit and your power and your holy, perfect, beautiful, majestic, wonderful, saving name, Lord Jesus, we pray.